Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the, this webinar, Loyally They Remain, Honoring Loyalist History Through Fiction, with our presenter, Jean Ray Baxter. Welcome, everyone, and happy Family Day. It's great to have so many people. This is the first uh, webinar, first in our speaker series from St. Albans Center, and we have over 150 people attending, so we're very pleased with that. Um, I would like to say a couple thank yous to begin with. First, uh, uh, the people that have supported this are the Writers' Union of Canada, the Canadian Council for the Arts, and a big shout out and thanks to Amber Meyer from the Lennox and Addington County Museum. As I said, we have uh, over 150 participants, uh, probably, to be honest, many more than we had anticipated, and my uh, humble uh, Zoom account only allows 100 people to do it, so we had to hold up our hands and say help, and the Lennox Addington community, in particular Amber, were great to come forward and help us with this, and she's working at home on Family Day and uh, supporting us, so just a huge thank you to them. Uh, my name is Axel Tesberg. I am the chair of the board of directors of Friends of St. Albans uh, Adolphus Town, or as we refer to ourselves, the St. Albans Center. Um, I will maybe talk a little bit about, uh, if I may, Friends of St. Albans or the St. Albans Center. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization that was formed uh, a, a couple years ago when St. Albans the Martyr United Empire Loyalist Church was disestablished as an active congregation. And we just were a bunch of people that didn't want to see it go to waste or go to ruin or who knows what. So we formed a not-for-profit corporation uh, 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 registered charity, and we have been working to purchase the church from the diocese. And this, as you see on the screen, is our mission as an organization, to transform St. Albans into a vibrant community hub while continuing to preserve, commemorate, and celebrate its unique heritage. And we are doing that through a number of different activities, albeit COVID curtailed those activities in the past year. We've had things like a fish fry. We've had uh, a writer's workshop. We've had the uh, Remembrance Day service. We've uh, had uh, you know, a Christmas event, uh, many things like that. Our plans would be to have in a range of eight to 10 events each year, some being the theater, live theater, some being music, and some with the traditional things that are associated with the church, such as the annual United Empire Loyalist Service. And if I may, put that in your calendar, June 19th this year, and you are all welcome to attend. So what is St. Albans Center, what previously used to be known as, uh, as St. Albans the Martyr United Empire Loyalist Church? Uh, for those of you who aren't aware of it, this is what it looks like. It's an old Gothic stone church, incredible architecture uh, in Adolphus Town. And for those that you don't know, Adolphus Town, and uh, Jean Ray will be talking about this, was one of the major United Empire Loyalist landing sites. It was built or started to be constructed in 1884 to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the landing of the Loyalists in 1784. A lovely building, both from an architecture and a history perspective. This is just what you see when you look inside to the front of the church. You'll see the, the lovely woodwork in the ceiling. You'll see the, the stained glass windows. And something that's unique is those encaustic tiles, that banner you see uh, sort of halfway up around the church. It encircles the whole church. And those are hand-laid tiles made in England that are to commemorate a number of the United Empire Loyalist uh, families. Unique in Canada, to our knowledge, the only other place there's such tiles is in the Capitol building in Washington. So worth a visit, if nothing else, just to see the tiles. Mm -hmm. If you look to the back of the church, you'll see more of the stained glass work, very unique stained glass windows in that uh, rose window in the back. And again, you see the woodwork in the ceiling. So. Uh, we really encourage you, invite you, if you have time, sometime to uh, drop by to Adolphus Town and see this. We started last year with opening on Saturdays and Sundays with a small cafe and the church open for tours. We hope this summer we'll be moving to a five-day-a-week format, so we'll basically be open you know, Wednesday through the weekend. So please come and uh, visit this lovely sort of rural gem, if you want, in Adolphus Town. 
At this point, I would like to uh, introduce Jean Ray Baxter. Uh, a couple of administrative things beforehand. So this, we're using the webinar format for Zoom in this presentation. That means you're all muted and you can't see anyone on the video. We uh, encourage you to ask questions at the top of your screen or depending on what format you have, maybe the bottom, there'll be something that's called Q&A. Please click on that and jump in, type in any questions when you have. We want to leave five or 10 minutes at the end to deal with any questions. After the session, in a couple days uh, afterwards, you'll get an email. We'll maybe respond to any questions we haven't answered uh, during the session, but also you'll get some information to the website, the Facebook page, things like that for St. Albans Center, as well as a place to possibly buy Gene Ray Baxter's books and some information about the uh, Lennox and Addington County Museum and some of their uh, events. So with that, I would like to introduce to everyone Jean Ray Baxter. Uh, Jean Ray grew up in Hamilton, although she likes to think of Essex and Kent County as her home. She has loyalist roots, but she also has French Canadian roots, which she says go back even a century before her United Empire loyalist uh, roots. Jean Ray has a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts from the University of Toronto and a Bachelor of Education education from Queen's University. During her long career as a secondary school English teacher, one of the things that, I'll use this word, Jean Ray, that irked her was the lack of history, in particular fiction, with respect to Canadian history and the UEL uh, Canadian perspective. So she went about to fix that. And she's written a series of books basically focused on the UEL experience, starting with the first one, The Way Lies North, which is the story uh, uh, of a family, a loyalist family, and the challenge they had in the Mohawk Valley before moving north. She's continued on with several other books in the series. The most recent one is The Knotted Rope. And you'll see both in her presentation and in her books, there is a bit of a theme about a focus on the Indigenous people as part of the UEL, as well as the Black people. And that's very appropriate that this is because this is Black History Month. And so we look forward to her presentations. Uh, she's received several awards uh, in both Canada and U.S., also written short stories and a murder mystery. Um, she uh, lives in Kingston. And one of the things she does is host writing workshops and seminars for up-and-coming writers. We had her host one in, in uh, St. Uh, Albans Centre, very well attended and everyone really enjoyed her insight in helping them write their own family history. So with that introduction, Jean Ray, over to you. Thank you very much, Axel, uh, for that generous introduction. Before I begin talking, I would also like to thank the Friends of St. Albans for hosting this, and my thanks to the Lennox and Addington County Museum and Archives for their technical support, and to the Writers' Union of Canada and the Canada Council for the Arts for their sponsorship. Well, many of you already know a great deal about the Loyalists, while some of you have told me that you know very little. For those who know a great deal, I hope that I managed to add something new. For those unfamiliar with the story of the Loyalists, I hope that I will not overwhelm you with battles, dates, and treaties. This event is brought to you as part of the Writers' Union of Canada's National Public Readings Program, and so it will include readings of excerpts from my books. But without, uh, without more ado, let us commence with some facts. During and after the American Revolution, between 70,000 and 100,000 loyalists fled or were driven from the country that became the USA. When you consider that the total white population of the 13 colonies was about two and a half million, that is a considerable loss. How did this happen? And what did the future hold for the Loyalists? In each of the six books in this Forging a Nation series, I, I focus upon one critical historical event or situation. And these are, first, General Burgoyne's defeat at the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. Second, Major Patrick Ferguson's defeat at the Battle of King's Mountain in 1780. Third, the British occupation of Charleston, 
from May 1780 to December 1782. Fourth, the experience of the indigenous people. Fifth, the building of new lives in loyalist settlements. And sixth, the enactment of legislation in 1793 to gradually end slavery in Upper Canada. No doubt other writers would make different choices and I would be interested in knowing what their choices would be. My own choices resulted from my determination to include the First Nations and the enslaved black population, as well as the settlers of European descent. In the first book, The Way Lies North, I begin with the Battle of Saratoga in October, 1777. It was a turning point in the American Revolution. Up until that time, the settlers in the province of New York were not firm in their support for either the loyalists or the rebel side. It would be fair to say that one third supported the rebels, one third wanted to remain loyal to Britain, and the other third were on the fence, wishing just to be left alone to carry on with their businesses and their farms. Whoever came out the winner, at the beginning of the rebellion, it looked as if the British would win. The Battle of Saratoga changed all that. Burgoyne's surrender. The British had planned a triple invasion of the province of New York, with three armies converging at Albany, the capital. General Burgoyne's army came down from the north, expecting to be joined by another army from the east and one coming from the west. If the plan had worked, the British might have won the war. But the other two armies failed to arrive because of sickness, transportation problems, and other delays. General Burgoyne's army outnumbered 20,000 to 6,000, that's approximately three to one, and exhausted after days of fighting, surrendered on October the 17th. One of the veterans of that battle, Peter Van Alstein is commemorated by a tile in St. Albans Church. In 1784, Major Van Alstein would lead a group of loyalists to their new home in the land granted them in Fourth Town, Adolphus Town's first name. After General Burgoyne's defeat at the Battle of Saratoga, the tide turned against those who wanted to remain loyal to Britain. In the Mohawk Valley of what is now New York State, roaming gangs called the Sons of Liberty physically attacked loyalists, stole their property, and burned their homes. At the same time, many local people previously on the fence turned against their loyalist neighbors. Some loyalists fled to New York City, which was a British stronghold, and some fled north to the wilderness that later became Canada. Among the most important loyalists from the Mohawk Valley was the Reverend John Stewart, whose memorial is also mounted in St. Albans Church Center. Stewart was an Anglican priest whose church at Fort Hunter had been attended by both indigenous and white people and white settlers. Right from the beginning of the conflict, Stewart was in trouble with the rebel authorities. The board to detect conspiracies had him arrested on suspicion of helping the enemy. He was in close confinement for four days, after which he was released on his own parole not to leave Schenectady. Stuart was released as part of an exchange of prisoners of war. In 1785, he moved to Cataraqui, now Kingston. There he conducted services at the Tete du Pont barracks a soldier pounding a drum to summon worshipers. John Stewart is a historical figure important in the background of The Way Lies North. Other characters who are fictitious represent a typical loyalist family. The protagonist is 15-year-old Charlotte. Two of her brothers died at the Battle of Saratoga. The family faces the fact that they will have to flee, leaving everything behind. I include some readings in this lecture 
and here is the first. As the family ate supper, Papa had more news to relate. On my way to Herkimer's farm, I passed by the church in Fort Hunter. There was singing and shouting inside that did not sound like a joyful noise under the Lord. I stopped my horse and went to the door. My dears, they have turned our church into a tavern. The scoundrels had a barrel of rum set upon the reading desk. I looked, then rode away. Reverend Stewart has angered every Whig in the valley, said Mama. He preaches loyalty to the crown and never omits prayers for the king. Now it seems that he has lost his church. I wonder what will happen to him and his family. They'll not come to harm, said Papa. John Stewart is respected by people in high places, but plain folks like us are not safe. What happened to this family was typical of the rebel treatment of loyalists after the tide turned against those loyal to King George. Many loyalists were farmers. There were also men prominent in public service, magistrates, justices of the peace, judges. There were clergy like the Reverend John Stewart. There were doctors and lawyers. There were graduates of Harvard and Yale. There were blacksmiths and innkeepers. None were safe in person or in property. But some fought back. Loyalist men took up arms, joining Butler's Rangers, Rogers Rangers, Jessup's Rangers, Brad's Volunteers, just a few whose names are well known. I come now to another turning point in the American Revolution. It is the Battle of Kings Mountain, which took place on the border between North and South Carolina. I deal with it in my second novel, Broken Trail. By 1780, it looked unlikely that Britain would be able to put down the rebellion. The Northern colonies would achieve independence, but there was still a strong possibility that Britain could retain the Southern colonies. In May 1780, Britain took control of Charleston. Heartened by this success, the commander of the British forces, General Lord Cornwallis, determined to help the Loyalists and suppress the rebels in the back country of South Carolina, where the situation was much the same as in the Mohawk Valley. For this purpose, Cornwallis sent the daring young officer, Major Patrick Ferguson, and his troops into the interior of North Carolina to aid loyalists and to forage from and punish rebels. Ferguson's army was made up entirely of loyalists whom he had recruited and trained himself. They were called the Loyal Americans. Ferguson marched his army into the back country, not knowing the kind of men who lived there. They were called over mountain men. They loved freedom, they loved their guns, and they knew how to use them. The protagonist in Broken Trail is a boy who was born white, but adopted by the Oneida First Nation and brought up to be a warrior. At the start of this book, the boy is being recruited to deliver a message about the impending danger. Here is how a British officer, a captain, explains the situation to him. We have an army on the march from Virginia, 1,000 loyalist troops. We call them the Loyal Americans heading west. Their commander, Major Patrick Ferguson, is an experienced military man. However, he made a rash boast that has put his whole army at risk. He sent a message to the over mountain men, threatening to march his army over the mountains hang their leaders and lay their country waste with fire and sword unless they stopped helping the rebels. To the boy, such a boast sounded reasonable. Among the Oneida, the boasting was part of the preparation for battle. Warriors boasted about how many enemies they would kill and how many scalps they would take. The captain continued, Major Ferguson is a Scot from Edinburgh. He's a brilliant man but he doesn't know a damned thing about those over mountain men. He laughed again, short, humorless laugh. Did you ever hit a hornet's nest with a stick? 
the boy said just once. Exactly. Over mountain men from every country west of Blue Ridge came swarming out hot as hornets. By reputation, they're great marksmen. No military training, no uniforms or provisions, no expectation of pay so far as anyone knows. Yet they've raised a militia over 1,000 strong. They plan to join forces with about 350 militiamen from other counties. They're bent upon one thing and one thing only, to wipe out Major Ferguson and all his men. The Overmountain men reacted immediately to Ferguson's challenge. They came from the back country of North and South Carolina and Georgia, and from the Otaga settlements in what is now Tennessee, while backcountry loyalists hunkered down in their log cabins and tried to stay safely out of the way. When Major Ferguson received word that his army was outnumbered, he called for reinforcements and then set off for Charlotte, North Carolina, to wait for the reinforcements to arrive. Ferguson and his men got only as far as Kings Mountain, 16 miles from, uh, from only as far as 60 miles from Charlotte. Kings Mountain had steep wooded sides rising to a bare flat top, and there he set up his camp. Ferguson sent a message to Cornwallis. I arrived today at Kings Mountain and have taken a post where I do not think I can be forced by a stronger enemy than that against us. The following day, the 7th of October, 1780, the Overmountain men stormed up the sides of the mountain. The loyalist troops saw them coming, scrambled to get themselves in battle order, but the fighting lasted less than one hour. Ferguson was in the thick of it. He had two horses shot from under him, seven balls passed through his body. The death of Patrick Ferguson. What made the Battle of Kings Mountain important was the encouragement it gave to the rebels. After being disheartened by the British occupation of Charleston, they were strengthened in their determination to win the war. For loyalists in the backcountry, Ferguson's defeat was a disaster. Subjected to increased persecution, many either fled to Charleston or took refuge in the swamps which were already a hiding place for fugitive slaves. This is South Carolina, backcountry swamp. I took this picture. I always like to go to the place where an event happened. I think you get a much better sense of, of, of the place. And uh, that is the sort of, that's the swamp, the kind of place where white uh, refugees from the rebels as well as escaped slaves went into hiding. And this is the beginning of the story of the Black Loyalists. In 1780, there were 38,000 Black people to 11,000 white people in South Carolina. 38,000 Black to 11,000 white. 98% of those Black people were slaves. They worked in the rice fields where the water was ankle deep and infested with alligators and snakes. The story of the Black Loyalists begins with Britain's offer of freedom to slaves owned by rebels. This offer was not inspired by any desire to end slavery. It was a stratagem for upsetting the economy of the rebelling Southern colonies. If an escaped slave remained behind British lines for one year, helping the military, he or she, was awarded a General Birch Certificate. And here is one. This is to certify to whomsoever it may concern that the bearer hereof, a Negro, resorted to the British lines in consequence of the proclamation of Sir William Howe and Sir Henry Clinton, late commanders in chief in America, that the said Negro has hereby his excellency Sir Guy Carleton's permission to go to Nova Scotia or wherever else we may think proper by order of Brigadier General Birch. In Freedom Bound, 
the third novel in my series, A Charleston Gentleman, explains the system to young Charlotte. She was the protagonist in The Way Lies North. Three years later, she is the main character in Freedom Bound. Newly arrived in Charleston, she has just witnessed the public whipping of a black man. She asks, what could that poor man have done to deserve such punishment? Most likely he's a runaway, 100 lashes for a correction. He's getting off lightly. Sometimes they tie a nail to the whip. It's horrible. Yes, ma'am, it is horrible. And it's a horror we brought upon ourselves. You mean slavery? I'm not against slavery. The prosperity of South Carolina depends on it. We couldn't grow rice and indigo without slaves to do the work. You could hire people, couldn't you? Cost too much. And you wouldn't find too many white people who'd want to do it. No, ma'am. The slave system is the only one that will work in the South. And it worked well until British policymakers hatched the idea that we could hurt the rebels by offering freedom to their slaves. All a slave had to do was stay behind British lines for one year, helping the military. At the end of the year, he's granted a General Birch certificate. Owning that certificate makes him a free man. Sounds to me like a good idea. Too good, as it's turned out. Word spread from one plantation to the next. Thousands of runaway slaves flocked to every town behind British lines. Most didn't know which, which side their owner was on. All they heard was freedom. On October the 19th, 1781, Lord Cornwallis surrendered his army at Yorktown in Virginia. The rebels had won. Now what would happen to the escaped slaves who had worked for the British? Certain death awaited them unless Britain took steps to save them. And that is exactly what happened. When Charleston was evacuated, the British made sure that they were not left behind. Evacuation of Charleston. The same crowded ship would carry white loyalists and slaves belonging to white loyalists crammed together with newly freed blacks awarded the General Birch Certificate. The evacuation ships were bound for different places, England, East Florida, the Caribbean, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. In Freedom Bound, Charlotte is on a ship bound for Halifax. Here is the scene she sees when she goes up on deck. She was not alone when she reached the deck. Other passengers were clustered in little knots, men and women, families, black people talking with other blacks, white people with other whites, still separated, although bound together in their fate. These were the loyalists of the Carolinas. She heard their soft Southern accents, as well as the unfamiliar sounds of the Gullah tongue spoken by some of the former slaves. Their sad voices mingled with the creaking of masts and spars as the Esperanza, carried by the tide and driven by an offshore wind, crossed the harbor bar. Gladness filled her heart at the thought of returning to the upper country, but no signs of joy brightened the faces of her fellow passengers. They were leaving forever the land of their birth. Their hearts were in the Carolinas. All that awaited them in the unknown country to the north were forests to be cleared, homes to be built, and the certainty of hardship for the rest of their lives. The Treaty of Paris, signed the 3rd of, 3rd of September, 1783, officially ended the American Revolution. Even before the treaty was signed, Guy Carleton, the last British Army and Royal Navy commander, had received orders from London for the evacuation of New York City. Slide 16. Okay. His orders were to proceed with the removal of refugees, liberated slaves, and military personnel as fast as possible. This was a terrific challenge because the city was overwhelmed with loyalists who had already fled for safety to this British stronghold. 
The evacuation began in November 1783. By the time it was complete, more than 29,000 loyalist refugees had been evacuated from New York City, as well as over 3,000 former slaves. What, what would happen with all these refugees, as well as the thousands of loyalists who had already fled north during the war? Some had found safety in established centers like Halifax, Montreal, and Detroit. Thousands more were crowded into forts like Fort Haldeman on Carleton Island and refugee camps like this one where Cornwall, Ontario is today. The Loyalist refugees lived in canvas army tents. Rations were limited to salt pork, rice, dried peas, and flour. They were stuck in these camps, waiting for their land grants until halfway through the 1780s. It took so long because the British authorities first had to purchase land from the indigenous people. Then the surveyors had to measure out the land and divide it into lots. When the loyalist settler finally received his location ticket, there were strings attached. The settler had to put up a house, clear so many acres of land, and have a certain number of acres under cultivation. He had to build a road across the front of his lot. If he failed to fulfill these conditions, he did not receive title to the land he had been granted. The authorities took it back. Some men failed. Some never even tried. For a few pounds ready money, the holder of a settlement ticket could write his name on the back of it and sell it to someone. Jobbers bought up hundreds of acres in this way. Yet many loyalists did try putting their backs and their hearts into the work, and so the settlements flourished. Altogether, there were 45 loyalist settlements in what are now the Maritime Provinces, Quebec, and Ontario. One of, the, one of them was Adolphus Town on the Bay of Quinte, where a party of loyalists led by Peter Van Alstyne landed in June 1784. There were 74 loyalist families known as the Adolphus Town Loyalists. I have not been able to find a contemporary drawing depicting their arrival, but the many reenactments staged by their descendants supply the lack. There were many settlements like Adolphus Town. The Niagara area was settled by loyalists. The region around Detroit had already been settled by the French. Now there was to be a new settlement as well, extending along the north shore of Lake Erie. In Nova Scotia, there was such a flood of loyalist refugees that the province had to be split in two, creating the province of New Brunswick in 1785. The loyalists were establishing themselves. They prospered, but the indigenous people who had been their allies did not. By running the international border through the Great Lakes and the rivers between them, the Treaty of Paris gave to the United States all the lands that Britain had reserved for the native people. When the terms of the Treaty of Paris were made known to Joseph Grant, the Mohawk war chief was furious. He briefly considered carrying on the fight without British help, but that was impossible. Without provisions and arms from the British, he and his warriors would have been doomed to fail. He foresaw that the Mohawks were about to become homeless refugees. General Haldeman, too, was shocked by Britain's abandonment of its native allies. He protested to the new British Prime Minister, Lord Shelburne. Lord Shelburne's response showed that he did not care what happened to them. The commander of Fort Niagara consoled the Iroquois living at the fort by being 1,800 gallons of rum. 
to keep them in good humor. General Haldeman thought that a better solution was to keep hammering at the government back in England. He made clear the danger of an Indian uprising if the government did not reverse its callous treatment of the native allies. The danger of an uprising was real. Joseph Brandt organized a meeting of Iroquois leaders with chiefs of other First Nations. 35 nations formed a loose federation to fight for land. Finally, London paid attention. The British were already in the process of buying land from, from the Mississaugas to settle white loyalists. The government now gave Haldeman authority also to buy land to compensate the Mohawks for their lost lands in the Mohawk Valley. London told him to spend whatever was needed. Haldeman started by buying a fine house for Joseph Brandt and another for his sister Molly in Kingston. He promised the Mohawks not only land, but also a sawmill, a grist mill, a school, and a church. To staff these facilities, there would be a miller, a blacksmith, a minister, and a schoolmaster. No other First Nation received compensation for its losses. Haldeman justified this expense by explaining to his superiors in London that the Mohawks were the most influential of all the Indian nations. Keep them happy, he argued, and there was little risk of an uprising. Governor Haldeman bought land on the Bay of Quinte wanting to consolidate the Mohawks close to Kingston where British officials could keep an eye on them. But as time went on, Grant wanted land closer to where other Iroquois nations still lived, hoping to bring them all together in a new community. Reluctantly, Haldeman agreed and bought still more land. 570,000 acres, six miles on each side of the Grand River for its entire length. Unfortunately, nobody knew how far the Grand River extended, an oversight which would cause problems in later years. Brant tried to persuade all the Mohawks to join the main group at Grand River, but some resisted, such as those who lived near Lachine in Quebec, and those whom Chief John Deserontian had led to the Bay of Quinte. In my fifth novel, Hope's Journey, Chief Jezerontian gives a speech urging the assembly of warriors to resist the move. He makes his speech in the Mohawk language, but here it is in English. He refers to Brandt by his Mohawk name, Tyandonegia. We built this village on the land on the Bay of Quinte that the British gave us to compensate for our lost home in the Mohawk Valley. As well as land, the British promised us a church, a school, a mill, and tools for farming. Most of us were satisfied with that, but not Tyandonegia. He persuaded Governor Haldeman to arrange for the additional grant of a great tract of land on the Grand River. The church, school, mill, and tools that were supposed to be for our village all went to the Grand River. When that happened, about 400 Mohawks left the Bay of Quinte and moved there. But Deserontian was determined to stay. Here he was the chief. If they moved to the Grand River, Tyendonegia would be the one in charge. Deserontian did not like that idea. And so he urged his followers to resist Brandt's smooth talk and bribes. He reminded them that they had started their own school and that the Reverend John Stewart came to conduct church services, he concluded, there's nothing we need that we don't have here. And here on the Bay of Quinty, just down the road from Adolphus Town, they have remained. Governor Haldeman, who had fought so hard for the Mohawks to be fairly compensated, would be shocked by how much the lands they were granted have shrunk over the years. The reserve on the Grand River is a mere patch compared with the original grant. The same thing happened here on the Bay of Quinte. The entire present township of Tyendonega was given to the Mohawks. 
Over the years, the government took most of it back. With the inconvenient Indian, to use Thomas King's very apt phrase, pushed out of the way, white settlements spread throughout Upper Canada, Lower Canada, and the Maritime Provinces. Roads were built, and settlement followed those roads. Here is the beginning of Young Street. Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor, John Graves Simcoe, was criticized for using the Queen's, the Queen's Rangers to build roads. Kingston's Richard Cartwright scoffed that we should be building roads between settlements, not roads where no settlements exist. But Simcoe was a visionary and he dreamed big. It was because of Governor Simcoe that Upper Canada became the first jurisdiction in the British Empire to pass legislation to end slavery. And here we come to the final part of this talk. It is appropriate in Black History Month that we should pay attention to the fight to abolish slavery in Upper Canada. The province of Upper Canada did not exist before the Constitutional Act of 1791. What became Upper Canada was part of Quebec, where slavery had existed from the 1600s. When the British conquered New France, the Articles of Capitulation made it clear that slavery was legal under British rule. Britain's loss of the 13 colonies brought an increase in the number of slaves to British North America. Loyalists who owned slaves brought them with them as personal property. By the 1790s, the number of slaves in the Maritimes, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island ranged from 1,200 to 2,000. There were about 300 in Lower Canada and between 700, 500 and 700 slaves in Upper Canada. Individuals from almost all levels of society owned slaves. Slave owners included government and military officials, disbanded soldiers, merchants, millers, blacksmiths, and clergy. The Reverend John Stewart brought his slaves with him. Joseph Brandt owned as many as 45. His sister Molly owned three. Willem, Willem Caniff's The Settlement of Upper Canada, a gold mine of information about the loyalists, contains this interesting nugget. Major Van Alstyne's slaves, whom he treated with patriarchal kindness, lived in great comfort in the old-fashioned Dutch cellar kitchen in his home in Forth Town. I am informed by historian Richard Perry that Major Van Alstyne had 10 slaves. Mr. Perry is also my source for the information that Captain Trumper had two, Captain Joseph Allen had at least three, and Captain Peter Rattan had two. When John Graves Simcoe arrived to take up his position as first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada, slavery was accepted by most as a fact of life, but not by Simcoe. He was an abolitionist. In a letter written soon after learning he was appointed Lieutenant Governor, Simcoe stated, from the moment that I assume the government of Upper Canada under no modification will I sent to a law that discriminates between the natives of Africa, America, or in Europe. Simcoe was bound, sooner or later, to introduce legislation that would lead to the abolition of slavery in Upper Canada. What triggered this action was the case of Chloe Cooley, a black woman owned by loyalist Adam Vrooman, who lived in Queenston. Vrooman had the legal right to sell his slave to any buyer he wished, whether in Upper Canada or in the United States. But Chloe Cooley objected violently to being tied up and thrown into a boat to be transported across the Niagara River. Vrooman's brother, and one of Ruman's friends came to help him subdue the kicking, screaming woman. The date was March the 14th, 1793. 
Two witnesses were Peter Martin, a black veteran of Butler's Rangers, and William Grisley, a white veteran of the same regiment. This is the incident with which I open The Knotted Rope, the final book in my series. All I have added to the historical account is the fictitious character Broken Trail. I make him a witness to the actual historical event. A woman's shrieks ripped through the silence. She was black and she fought like a trapped beast, feet, knees, fists, arms, teeth, terror in her eyes. Three white men held her down, grunting, cursing, trying to tie a rope around her ankles. Their boat waited, bobbing on the slushy water among the chunks of broken ice. Broken Trail's fingers gripped the handle of his tomahawk. He had to help that woman. Mind and body, he was ready to attack. But if he used that tomahawk, he might harm her as she writhed and struggled to escape. For the same reason, he dare not use his rifle. No weapon then, just his bare hands. He sprang like a cougar, wrapping his arm around the neck of one man. But there were three, and they were tough, muscular men. One pulled him off, sending him flying with a blow to the head. He rose from his hands and knees, his mind and body burning to fight again, but it was too late. The men had the woman tied. She was trussed like a chicken, but still shrieking as they threw her into the boat. They jumped in and took up the oars. The boat pulled away across the Niagara River. When Broken Trail turned his head, he saw that he was not the only witness. Two men, one white and the other black, stood watching him. They were not young, but not old either. Their steady gaze suggested the resolve of experienced soldiers who knew when to fight and when to draw back. They walked up to Broken Trail. You can't help her that way, said the white bystander. The law is against you. What law? Broken Trail asked. The law that makes that woman a piece of property. She's a slave. Her owner has the right to take her over to New York and sell her. If you were caught fighting to free her, it's you who'd go to jail. Broken Trail, still groggy, shook his head. If that's the law, then it must be changed. That's what we think too, said the black man. He paused. You look ready for a fight. Do you want to help us change the law? Leave the young fellow alone, said the white man. His eyes moved from Broken Trail's scalp lock to his leather poncho and his buckskin leggings. Can't you see he's half Indian? Slavery isn't his problem. This is not his fight. Maybe it is my fight, said Broken Trail. I was born white but raised Oneida. Think how the native people have been treated. I've seen a lot of injustice in my life. The woman was still screaming, but the clamor lessened as the boat pulled further away. I'll tell you something, the white man said. There are plenty of people in Upper Canada who want to end slavery, but the rich people who control the government are the ones who own slaves. They don't want any change. Except for the lieutenant governor, the black man said. Simcoe is rich but he's an abolitionist. He's just waiting for a chance to end, end slavery in this province. This may be the chance he's waiting for, said the white man. He raised his eyes to the river where the boat was halfway to the far shore. The woman's screams were fainter now. If Simcoe hears about this, it may be the spur he needs to put pressure on the men who make the laws. History does not tell us what happened to Chloe Cooley after she was sold. But William Grisley and Peter Martin went to, went to Newark, present day Niagara-on-the-Lake, which was the seat of government for Upper Canada at that time, to report the incident to Simcoe. Simcoe was spurred to action. During the second session of the first parliament of Upper Canada, May the 31st, 1793, he instructed Attorney General White to introduce to the House of Assembly, the elected lower house, a bill to, present, to prevent 
the further introduction of slaves. The preamble goes, whereas, slide, whereas it is unjust that a people who enjoyed freedom by law should encourage the introduction of slavery in this province, and whereas it is highly expedient to abolish slavery in the province, so far as the same gradually be done without violating private property, be it, an, be it enacted by the King's most excellent majesty and by and with the advice and consent of the Legislative Council and Assembly of the Province of Upper Canada, etc. Whereupon the Act repealed a former law that allowed settlers to bring their slaves with them into the province and stated, nor shall any Negro or other person who shall come or be brought into the province after the passing of this act be subject to the condition of a slave. The bill provided that the owners of slaves should be secured in their property and that contracts already made should not be altered. But here's the chief provision. In order to prevent the continuation of slavery within this province, immediately from and after the passing of this act, every child shall, shall be born of a Negro mother or other woman subjected to such servitude as aforesaid, shall abide or remain with the master or mistress to whose service the mother shall be living at the time of the child's birth until such child shall have obtained the age of 25 years, at which time such child shall be discharged from any further service. To prevent any difficulty from uncertainty of age, the owner was legally obliged to register the birth of such child subject to a considerable fine if he or she did not do so. The first step for this bill to become law was its passage in the House of Assembly. Of its 16 members, six were slave owners. One of them was Peter Van Alstyne. Strong opposition was expressed in debate during the three required readings of the bill. Some wanted to reject it outright. Others wanted to supply themselves for the future by being allowed to import slaves for two more years. But the bill passed and went on to the upper house, the Legislative Council, where the bill passed unanimously, although six of the nine members were slave owners. The new legislation did not actually free any slaves, not even one. Anyone who was already enslaved would remain a slave for life. Then what difference did the new law make? For slave owners, it threatened the value of their investment. Afraid that the movement toward total abolition would continue, some sent their slaves to be sold in the United States. Others disliked the fact that they would have to set free at age 25 any slave born after July the 9th, 1793. Why feed and clothe for 25 years a young person who would have to be freed at the very age when he or she became really valuable. This expense was deeply resented. Yet, most slave owners determined to make the best of it. After all, any slave born before July the 9th, 1793, was a slave for life, and that could be a very long time. The buying and selling of slaves for life continued. To be sold. A black woman named Peggy, aged about 40 years, and a black boy, her son, named Jupiter, aged about 15 years, both of them the property of the subscriber. The woman is a tolerable cook and washerwoman and perfectly understands making soap and candles. The boy is tall and strong of his age and has been employed in country business, but brought up principally as a house servant. They are each of them servants for life. Note the phrase, servants for life. The price for the woman is $150. For the boy, $200, payable in three years. He gives the terms there. That's York. That's, that's Toronto. 
20 years before he came to Toronto. It is interesting that the boy who's 15 years old, if he'd been two years younger at that date, he would have qualified for being freed at the age of 25. But he's not. He's 15, so he's a slave for life. In 1798, an effort was made to partly reverse the 1793 Act to limit slavery. A bill was introduced to authorize persons coming into this province to settle, to bring with them their Negro slaves. The House of Assembly passed this bill by a vote of eight to four, but it was stalled in the Legislative Council and died at the end of the session. No further attempt was ever made to get rid of the 1793 Act limiting slavery. With the passage of time, the number of slaves for life decreased as they died off. Also, the abolitionist message finally changed white attitude. It became common for slave owners to refer to their slaves as servants, as Peter Russell does in his advertisement you have on the screen, even though they were not legally free. In March 1824, in the last recorded sale of a slave in Upper Canada, Eli Keeler of Colburn sold his slave Tom to William Bell of Thurlow, now Belleville. In 1834, the year slavery became illegal throughout the British Empire, only a very small number of black people, maybe 50, remained in bondage in this Upper Canada. And this is where I stop. I have come to the end of my story about the Loyalists, white, black, and indigenous. I wanted to show the experience of each that's distinct and different from that of the others. Today, each has woven a unique strand into the complex fabric of Canada.